My mom just called and said, I saw you on the tube. I had to call her back because I'm performing at the Louvre. And they don't like rap, but I'm a different kind of dude. I'm just praying that these blessings don't burn out before I do. Because I ain't never been here. But I knew I could get there. Used to watch the Grammy stages, thinking that I fit there. Used to tell my granny, Baby J would make it big, yeah. She used to say I already was, but she was still here. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> I didn't expect that. She used to say I already was, but she was still here. And I know that she's smiling down upon me while I'm shining. And I know that this song gonna reach heaven to Brandon's mama. And I know all them nights I spent crying in my apartment was really just a test of my patience with God's time and see, this is what I was made for. It's not an option. If you knew you could be great, why would you stop it? If all your dreams passed you today, would you just watch it? Or would you risk it all on faith the way that I did? Good morning, Durham. Good morning, Bull City. How y'all doing? I almost did something there that I hate doing, which is saying Raleigh Durham. I, I, am, uh, I am from the Bull City, so I like to say Durham first. So uh, what's up? Thank y'all. How y'all feeling? Everybody feeling good? Cool, man. Cool. Well, my name is Joshua Gunn. I'm excited to share my story with y'all today. Um, Muse is our topic. Muse is our theme. But I have uh, interpreted that theme in a, somewhat of a different way. And I want to talk to you about remembering the dream. So as I started to think about this theme, the first thing I had to do was figure out what the hell Muse actually meant, right? <laughs> so uh, the definition of Muse is on your screen. A person or personified thing that uh, is the source of inspiration for a creative artist. And as I started to think about me, I wanted to think about you know, what is my muse? What actually inspires me throughout my life? So I'm a hip-hop artist. I've been making music since I was seven years old, and there's many things that have inspired me along that time. I'm a dad now, as, as you heard, and I love my kids. They inspire me every day. I love my wife. She inspires me. I love the city that I'm from. It inspires me. But as I thought more about it, my muse uh, is actually this dream that I've always had, this dream that's uh, been a part of my life since I was born. This dream that sort of is the driving force for anything that I do. But I want to tell you about the dream and I want to tell you about it backwards. I actually want to start the story in the middle. So, but I also am going to break down the word MUSE as an acronym to help me tell the story. So the first sort of acronym I'll use for MUSE is many unspoken expectations. So if you were to ask me at, uh, when did my dream start, I'd show you a picture of this guy. It's a little bit blurry, but that's me about 10 years ago, about 12 years ago, on the campus of North Carolina A&T State University with a microphone in my hand, and this person had a dream. This person, if you ask them what they wanted to be, they tell you they want to be a successful rapper. But when I said that at 20 or however old I was in this picture, I had many unspoken expectations of what a successful rapper would look like. And that sort of looked like this to me. <laughs> or, or like this. Or maybe even that. Okay, maybe not that, but you get, you get, you get the point. Uh, I'm going to leave this ironic picture of Gucci Mane up behind me as I start to begin the story. Um, but it was really, you know, I was thinking in college at the time about being a successful rapper and pursuing my dreams, and it really became about money and about cars and about jewelry and women and fame. And that really became what, what I thought my dream was. Right? If you were to ask me in 2006 when I took that picture, these are the things that I wanted. These are the things that became the guiding light uh, for me. This became my muse. Money, cars, jewelry, women, fame. And it became my compass. Right? Uh, it was the, the, the driving force. My north star was money, cars, jewelry, fame. And so I went through the next few years with that in my mind, with that as my guiding source. And as I was creating music, it became less about the fun of creating it, less about what I was saying, who I was touching, who I was reaching with the music, and more about getting to this goal of making some sort of money and some fame. Uh, so I continued to pursue music to some relatively decent local success uh, while I was in college. And I went to college with no intention of graduating. I hope my parents aren't here to hear that. But <laughs> I, I had no intentions on graduating college. It was just something to do as I waited for the big opportunity or the big break. Uh, and that took me six years to wait. Um, so not planning to graduate, man, I didn't go to class very often. I mean, I just went to class just enough so I could see people and perform my music and let them know about what I was doing the next weekend or what club I was performing at. But after a while, my friends started to graduate. Um, you know, 
the, all the people that I came into school with and I enjoyed being around left. And so in uh, 2007 or so, I said, well, shit, I better uh, start going to class. And fortunately, I don't know if they still do this, but at that time, you could retake classes. So I had failed damn near every course over a three-year period. Uh, and then I just took a huge 24-hour workload each semester. I took summer school, and I caught up, and I ended up graduating from school. And I'm sitting there wondering, you know, again, this is still my compass, right? I'm still focused on money, cars, jewelry, and fame. And I'm like, man, music's really not cutting it. I better figure something to do. I'm going to graduate. All my friends are gone. My audience is gone. What will I do? So what else do you do to make money? You have to go get a job, right? And um, so I thought about what can I do, right? I can communicate pretty well. I have a psychology degree that I don't, I didn't pay much attention to any of my psychology courses. So I, c I can't be a very good counselor or clinician. So I decided I better get a job. There was a career fair on campus. I made up a resume and I walked in and there was a table for a company called Cargill. Anybody know what Cargill does? It's the least cool rapper thing to work at Cargill. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they had a sales position selling animal protein. And I was like, okay, I'm going to sell meat, I guess. Um, but it's you know, sort of big industrial meat factory selling them to distributors and grocery stores. I didn't give a shit about any of that. All I cared about was the fact that they were going to offer me $65,000 a year. I had probably $13 in my pocket at that interview. So $65,000 a year sounded like a million dollars to me. So I'm like, sign me up. I don't care. They also were going to relocate me, so take me out of North Carolina where I had spent my entire life, send me to another place that I could live. And they did. So I took a job in the Philadelphia area selling meat for Cargill, um, making a decent, what I thought was a lot of money actually at the time. And I got a really cool waterfront apartment in Wilmington, Delaware. Not, not the most exciting city. <laughs> <laughs> But nonetheless, I had, I had what I thought was an amazing view, right? So think about what my compass was at the time or what my muse was. It was just things, right? I just wanted things. So I had this cool waterfront apartment, and I'm like, man, okay, I got to get a car. So $65,000 a year, I got a brand new Ford Taurus. I love that car. It was like, to me, it was like a Bentley. It might as well have been a Bentley, right? <laughs> Leather seats, sunroof. You couldn't tell me shit in that car. You couldn't tell me anything. <laughs> So this, was a, this is an actual picture of that car. And uh, so I had the cool apartment, I had the job that was making money, and I had a car that I thought was cool. I could go out on weekends, I could buy out you know, a round of drinks for my friends, and you know, buy my girlfriend uh, you know, Mark Jacobs jewelry or whatever the thing was at the time. And so um, with money and cars and jewelry and fame as my compass, music became less interesting for me. So this thing that I've been doing my whole life just became less interesting because it wasn't paying the bills. It wasn't providing me these things that had become my dream. But selling meat, <laughs> this job was, right? <laughs> and so through that process, uh, I sort of gave up. I was like, you know, maybe music wasn't meant for me. Maybe this wasn't actually why I was put here. Maybe I was actually put here to go to work every day, sell some product to somebody, and cash a check. So was a tough realization for me, but at the time, I felt good. I felt like I had made it, right? I was not living at home anymore. I could sort of fend for myself and buy anything that I wanted, so I was living the dream, as they say. And at the time, Muse meant something different to me. It meant maybe you should evolve. And that meant maybe you're not a rapper anymore. Maybe this is the new evolution of who you are. You are a professional. You can sell things. You can... Uh, use your communication skills to provide for yourself. And so I did evolve. I completely stopped making music. If people would ask me what's up with my music, I would tell them some sort of lie, like, hey, man, I'm, I'm working on something. In reality, I hadn't written a song in probably two years. Um, so one day I get a call from my really good friend and fraternity brother. His name is Rashad. I'm sitting in my apartment, 2009, and... I, I want to brag to him. When he calls me, I was like, I haven't heard from you in a while. I was like, what's up? Yeah, man, just sitting here on the waterfront, checking out my view and, you know, eating a steak and uh, life's good. And he was like, what happened to your dreams, man? And it pissed me off. I was furious with him. I was like, what do you mean? I'm living my dreams. I, I'm doing very well. I felt so successful at the time. And he was like, but what about that dream you told me about in 2004 when we met? And I was like, yeah, I'm still doing music. I still, he's like, no, you're not. He's like, you've completely given up on your dreams, and it's sad. 
He was like, frankly, it's sad to be around you. It's sad to watch you pretend like this thing is not missing from your life. And so in his mind, Muse meant something different. It meant many of us surrender early. Many of us give up on our dreams when we're very close to that breakthrough, right? So you've probably seen this cartoon before, but it's two guys uh, trying to mine for diamonds and you know, the struggle is very difficult as you're working towards your breakthrough, and, but most people quit when they're right here because it's gotten so difficult, it's gotten so hard, you're not able to see on the other side, so you just walk away and make another decision. So Rashad actually sent me this cartoon in 2009, and at the time, I sort of ignored him and hung up the phone, furious with him, but he was absolutely right. I had given up on my dreams. And... Um, I continued to work in the job, continued to make money, until one day, I go to the bar on a weekend, and I want to buy drinks for all my friends. I had some friends visiting me in town, and again, if you think about it, I'm making $65,000 a year, which I thought was a lot of money, but when you're buying drinks every weekend, and you got an apartment that you can't afford, and you know a car that you probably spent too much money on, um, anyway, I swipe my card, and it gets declined. And all my friends from North Carolina are visiting me. Super embarrassed. So I go check my bank account, negative $430 or something like that. I'd just been sort of drowning myself in excess and pretending like everything was OK. And in reality, I was not happy. I was working a job I didn't love, and I was broke. So I thought back to this sort of cartoon that Rashad sent me. And it made me think about this kid. That's an ugly picture. This kid right here. <laughs> Don't laugh, my mom did my hair that day, so. Uh, <laughs> well, this kid, this is me at 10 years old, right before I went to sixth grade. And this kid had a different dream. This kid wanted to make music, but he wanted to do it for different reasons. It wasn't about the money, the cars, the jewelry, or the fame. This kid had a talent that he felt like he was given, and he wanted to use it. He wanted to use it to inspire people. He wanted to be heard. He wanted to perform. He enjoyed entertaining people. And not once did he think about the money, the cars, the jewelry, or the fame. This was the dream in 1995. Performing, seeing the world, inspiring people, being heard, and most importantly, making a difference in the world. That's what this guy, and maybe even this guy, <laughs> wanted out of life. And so the conversation with Rashad reminded me of this dream, and I recalibrated, I readjusted my compass, and I said, you're right, bro. And I called him, and I asked him if he would help me. And that was, he was obviously excited that I called, because the reason why he called me the first time is because he wanted to help. And so we together started our own record company called Red Eye Lifestyle in 2009, and decided to put out our own music. He was going to help me pay for it, because obviously I was broke. And he was going to help encourage me to leave an occupation or a job that I didn't love and, and move back home and start to create again in the place that inspired me in the first place. So we did that. We recalibrated our compass. I, I took a different turn and I left that job in the Philadelphia area and I started making music again. In that same year, we released our first single. We released uh, our own album. We ended up with a huge feature in XXL Magazine. If those of you follow hip hop, it was the biggest magazine at the time. And we got selected for the BET Music Matters campaign. All of that in the same year. So things were ramping up and it, it, it was affirmation for me or confirmation for me that living in your purpose uh, creates results. It, it, it works if you actually live in your purpose and remember the initial dream. So we're doing really, really well. I'm um, excited about this. BT Music Matters at the time, it was featuring me, an artist named Miguel, who you may know, <laughs> who's fairly huge. Um, several other artists who have gone on to do amazing things. And me, this little kid from Durham, was being featured alongside of them, all because I recalibrated. At the same time, I was able to meet my heroes. In 2012, I signed my first record deal with the legendary MC, MC Light. So she's a legendary, iconic hip hop artist, and she came to Greensboro to meet me and instantly signed me to a record deal on the spot. So, you know, think about the kid in 2009 or the person in 2009 that was selling meat. Today, I'm on the red carpet at the BET Awards in 2012 with MC Light. 
I got to work with people like Snoop Dogg and legendary artists like Rakim and did a business partnership with Damon Dash, the founder of Rockefeller Records. And things are going really well. I also got a chance to see the world. That was one of my dreams as well. I've been to Dubai and I've toured in Korea and uh, you know, we did Venice and Rome and Egypt and I've, I've been able to leave my surroundings and now I'm feeling really, really great. I'm feeling like Rashad was right, right? Remember that dream, it, it, it guided me on the right place or the right path. So I'm getting close to it, right? I'm sure you guys have seen this cartoon, that's the finish line. And in reality, it sort of looked like this, right? It wasn't a straight line, it didn't get me there overnight, but I'm feeling like I'm still on this path to success. I'm feeling really, really good about living in my purpose and remembering my dream. And this was the moment that for me it all sort of came uh, full circle and I felt really close to that finish line on this night. This was 2017, or 2016, I'm sorry, just a couple years ago. I was featured in a BET series called Music Moguls. I, w I got a chance to star in the series alongside Dame Dash, Jermaine Dupri, Snoop Dogg, and Birdman of Cash Money. And I'm feeling like I'm really close to getting that breakthrough. But at this moment, standing on this red carpet around all of these successful celebrity uh, personas, something happened. Something happened that uh, took me back to that 2006 dream. So all of a sudden, I have everything that I want. If you remember that 1995 dream, I had it all, right? I had checked every single, every single one of those boxes that 10-year-old me wanted to do. But I started to think about what 20-year-old wanted me to do standing on this red carpet. And all of a sudden, I was like, I got to go get the money. I got to go get the fame. I got to go get the cars. All of a sudden, it triggered that in me again and uh, sort of knocked my compass out of whack again. So I decided I need to pursue a major record deal. Now, keep in mind, for the eight years, I was running my own record company, putting out my own music, keeping all the money, controlling my sort of destiny, uh, performing, doing everything on my own, but some, for some reason I felt like I needed to go to a big record label and get a big check so I could drive a Bentley and pull up downtown and have jewelry on and all the things that that 2006 dream uh, was. And so we did. We went and we pursued several record labels. I hired new management. Uh, Rashad, who helped me really get to the point, I sort of put him to the side because he couldn't get me to that 2006 dream. I needed to level up, as they would say. So by leveling up, I found management that could walk me into the doors of Cash Money Records, that could then walk me into the doors of Republic Records, which is the company that owns Cash Money. So we went through about a seven month period of interviews and demo sessions and recording sessions with Republic Records until they get to the point where they call me one day and they say, hey, we want to sign you. I want to sign you to a, a record deal. And the advance was somewhere north of $700,000. So I get the deal memo, which is sort of how this process starts. You get a memo, which is a shortened version of the contract. And I'm like, I'm telling everybody that that's close to me. We did it, man. We're going to make it. We did it. So we fly to LA. We take a meeting in LA. And uh, I'm like, OK, where's the contract? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. I was like, we got it. They're like, we do all the deals in our New York office. So we want to get you to the New York office. This is the guy. His name was Naeem McNair who was the senior vice president of Republic Records at the time. We'll meet you in New York, we'll get the deal done. So I'm still like, okay. It, when I'm flying from LA to New York, something just feels off, something feels strange. It wasn't that I didn't want the record deals. Not, it wasn't that I didn't want the $700,000 and the, the big marketing push. Something just felt strange. Even sitting in this office, so th this is Rashad here, uh, my friend, business partner. This is Morgan, who is our videographer, who's documented everything over the past 10 years. And this is me. Um, it didn't feel like home to me. It didn't feel like I was actually living in my purpose. It felt like I was getting ready to sell my soul. It felt like I was getting ready to give up on that 1995 dream and trade it for the 2006 dream. But I pressed on because I had kids now. Uh, I needed money. And I was, frankly, exhausted with running my own company all by myself. So we get to New York City, and they put us in a back room. They, there's like big welcome to Republic Record signs, welcome Jay Gunn, we're excited to see you. They put me in a back room and waited for an hour. And then I waited for two hours, waited for three hours, and I'm like, yo, what, what's going on? So we're calling Naeem, who was the senior vice president at the time, like, yo, what's up? 
No answer. No answer. Finally, someone comes in with what we thought was some good news. They're like, hey, you're not going to meet with Naeem today. You're going to meet with Wendy Goldstein. I don't know if you all follow the music industry, but Wendy Goldstein is like 40 years in the music industry. She's one of the most iconic record executives, and she's at this time the head of urban music at Republic. I was like, oh, shoot, we meeting with the boss. We meeting with the, you know, the head honcho, so to speak. And so we go into Wendy's office, and Wendy stands up and shakes my hands. She says, thank you for coming. We'll talk to you soon. I didn't get to play music for her. I didn't get to talk about this contract that I'd seen. It turns out that Naeem got fired that week in LA. Naeem was fired from the senior vice president position or demoted actually to an A&R. So now my in was gone. Wendy had never heard of me, never saw me. I waited for four hours for her to shake my hand and tell me deuces, right? Thanks, for, thanks for, you know, like the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory scene. You get nothing, right? Thank you for playing, you get nothing. And at that moment, I thought my life was over. I had dedicated every possible thing for, the pa for that year or two that I decided that this was my new goal to this vision. I had no job. I had a kid. I had given up on promoting my own music, so my buzz had all but dwindled, right? I wasn't performing. I wasn't doing shows. Um, but I had one more thing left. I had got booked for my own tour. This was months before. I got booked for my own tour in Korea. So I call my new road manager at the time, and I say, bro, I'm not going to Korea. I'm done. I give up. Completely defeated. I don't want to perform anymore. I don't want to write music anymore. I'm going to go back to get a job and figure out what else the rest of my life looks like? Because my compass had got thrown off again, right? I was only thinking about the money and the fame and those things that I saw at that BET event that night and that I desperately wanted or needed to feel like I was validated, right? Or that I had did what, you know, people tell me a successful artist looks like and that's money and fame and cars and jewelry. So I'm not going to Korea and I don't want to rap anymore and I hang up. Well, unfortunately, after hanging up on him, he had to pick me up and take me to the airport to get home. So. <laughs> Um, so we, he's like, don't worry about it, we'll talk about it on the plane. We get on the plane and I cry and I cry. None of my team, the people that were around me had ever seen me like this. I mean, just crying, bawling, grown man tears uh, on this plane from New York to home. And uh, Brown, who was my <coughs> road manager at the time, he says, bro, it's gonna be all right. And it, that nothing pisses you off more than feeling like your life is over and someone says, it's going to be all right. <laughs> so I'm going to fast forward to this picture. So this is me standing in front of a flyer for one of my concerts in Seoul, Korea, just a few weeks after the Republic situation. So obviously I went. And as we took this picture, Brown, my road manager, said, remember when I told you it was going to be all right? I was like, yeah. He was like, think about what you're doing. Think about what you're doing right now. Think about what this kid would have thought if you told him that a few years from this picture or this picture, you'd be standing in Seoul, Korea, getting ready to perform at a sold out show with your name as the headliner. That to me, that was my dream. It had nothing to do with the money or the cars or that big record deal or a video with Lil Wayne or all the other stuff that Republic was promising me. This was the dream. This was what success looked like. And that was my own internal compass for what success looked like. Not what other people defined as successful. Not the, the awards or the trinkets that society gives us for uh, these accomplishments. This feeling right here was what I was working for all of these years. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be someone who, who saw the world, who used his talents to inspire people, someone who uh, was revered as a talent or a creative uh, in this art form that I had given my life to. In this picture, I keep this on my phone, and it reminds me that I made it. And after that, I didn't care what anybody else thought. I didn't care if people thought I was successful or not. I didn't care if people thought I was a failure or that I should give up following my dream, because I made it. If you were to ask this kid, this guy is his, his role model. This is the guy he wanted to be when he was standing in his room making tapes and trying to perform for his big brother. This is this, is this person. 
So after that, I reflected on this 1995 dream and realized that I checked every single one of these boxes. But then I thought about the fact that it, ain't, it wasn't really always just about music. It was about being able to make use of my skills every day. So this talent that I have, I can communicate, I can move rooms, I can inspire people. That's bigger than music. That's bigger than just limiting myself to being a rapper for the rest of my life. And so now, I'm still performing. I'll be performing at Art of Cool Festival tomorrow. I opened a co-working space in Durham called Provident 1898, which is centered around creating space and opportunity for underserved entrepreneurs and creatives. Right, so being able to use my talents in a different way to inspire and uplift the future generation. I'm a father, this is my daughter Harlem right here, and I'm also running for city council. Right, so I'm thinking about other ways that I can inspire folks. What can I do to give back to the community that's given me so much? Uh, and it ain't just about rap anymore, right? But I, I am clear now that my dreams have come true and I wanna help other people do that, right? And, I, and, and what I'm here to remind you of is remember the dream. Remember what that dream was. Remember why you started in the first place. Not the things that the dream gets you, not the things that you want the dream to give to you, but remember your original dream. Remember your five-year-old self or your 10-year-old self. Remember what they wanted out of life. Ask yourself if they were you right now or if they knew that they could be you right now, would they be happy? And if the answer is yes, then you're already living in that dream. If the answer is no, I encourage you to recalibrate and find that compass and allow that to guide you with your five-year-old or your 10-year-old dream. So please, remember the dream. Thank you. Huh? That's awesome. Yeah. Um, we have some time for questions. I can bring the mic around. Anyone? If you want to put your hand up, that'd be great. No questions? Uh, thank you very much. Talk to us a little bit more about uh, running for city council, how it relates to your story, and how you can use the parts of the story you've just shared with us to, to help the city. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so I can't campaign, right? So, um, but you know, I, running for office or a government position is about public service, right? It's about, uh, I get uneasy when people treat it like a career because this creative music, entrepreneurship, that's my career. Running for office is about creating space for all people in a city where I don't feel like their voices are being heard, right? When we talked about my 1995 dream, it was about being heard. And I know what it feels like to not be heard. I know what it feels like to be the awkward kid in the class who can't get a word in or the person whose opinion doesn't, f you don't feel like it matters because you don't have the money or you don't have the status or whatever it is that we value in this society. So for me, running for office is about uh, creating a voice for the voiceless. That, that, that's what it's about. You can, I can probably hear. That's a, yeah, uh, I, I'm obviously a bit jaded because I grew up making music here and uh, felt very unsupported by the community in general. Like folks, regular people have supported me. Um, but when I've traveled and I noticed that cities invest in artists, right, and governments invest in artists and uh, private organizations invest in artists in places like Austin or places like Paris or Dubai, which has an amazing art scene that you probably wouldn't even expect if I said Dubai, but they are constantly investing in not only art spaces, but art artist fellowships and artist opportunities. Um, so I think North Carolina's got a long way to go in terms of understanding that art takes investment. Um, our art scene, I think, has thrived in spite of a lack of investment because we do have a phenomenal art scene. I could name you probably 20 people in the past 10 years that have won Grammys or done something spectacular in the arts. Um, but I, I, I would like to see more investment. I'd like to see more community investment, more private investment, uh, and more opportunities in, in for artists in general. Yep. Was there any threat from the adults 
Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so there is, that's a great question about how do we help. So there is a program called Backline that is from Milwaukee. It is basically what American Underground is for technology. Are you all familiar with American Underground or uh, I incubator spaces? It's that for musicians, and it gives them uh, so it's sort of like a fellowship. Each musician that qualifies gets $20,000 for six months to pursue an album. And so the biggest hurdle for artists, especially those of us who don't come from any sort of money or, or, or means, is just being able to dedicate time to your craft because you got to you know, go work or wait tables or, or work as a barista or whatever it is that you do to, you know, to make a living. Uh, and that takes away from your creative spirit. So this backline incubator program is interested in coming to Durham. And so I think, you know, in a real tangible way, supporting that program is a way that we can help. They need private investment to run the program. Um, those are the types of things that I'd like to see us advocate for, whether it's backline or something else. That's the way that we all can help. You know, it's less about me now. You know, I'm 35, right? So my, you know, I've done this, right? And I'm going to continue to do it, but I'm more concerned about the 15-year-old kid that's, that's, or that 10-year-old kid that's me um, in the room looking at a dream. So supporting organizations like that, I think, is the best way we can all help. Now, lots of questions now. Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as kind of talking about uh, education and kind of that system we live in, uh, when you were when you went through the Kennedy Prize system in your four years, um, how do you feel like you know it's more of like from my outside perspective, it got better. You got jumped in front of the train a little bit, as mm -hmm. you said, but then when I was reading your book, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, um, sort of all of the things that I talked about uh, help educate me on how to make money in music. And um, the old model that I was still trying to pursue just a few years ago of signing to a record label, getting an advance, and then sort of working that advance off. Uh, does everyone know how that process works? Or should I give like a quick? Yeah. All right, so if I had gotten that $700,000 check from Republic, it would have been more like $300,000 cash and $400,000 in a recording uh, and production budget to complete my project. Um, that's essentially a loan, right? So record labels today are just banks, right? They take an artist, they say, you're good. And in, in, in today's industry, it's less about finding an artist who's talented and more about finding an artist who's already got a following, who really doesn't need you, but they could use a loan, right? They could really use that $700,000 to take it to the next level, but you go in debt for that. And because of the way streaming works, so you go on Spotify, you stream my songs, um, if you stream my songs 10,000 times in a month, I'll probably make about $9, right? So it's a pretty broken model. Spotify makes a lot more than that. Um, but the point is to pay off, and if I were to get that $9, that would go to the label every month, and then I would gradually be paying off that $700,000 loan. So it's really not a good deal for artists. But what is a good deal is doing what we do, which is being independent, creating your own product, and then marketing it yourself. It's much harder work and you don't get the $700,000 up front, which would you know, be nice, right? They give you a little breathing room. Um, but you control your own destiny, right? And you really, you sort of, uh, as they say, you eat what you kill in the music industry now, right? You go out, you perform, you get your receipts at the end of the night, and you know what you're taking home, and you share it with your team, but you're not then paying off some sort of loan. Um, and so in many ways, artists are doing better now. Artists that understand that system are doing better now than they were in... I mean, you've heard the stories about TLC or, you know, your favorite artist who goes broke as soon as their career is over. Um, and that's because they're in debt to the record label and they never really get a, you know, a paycheck like you or I would be used to. Um, they just get one loan and have to sort of live off that loan forever. Um, but in today's industry, you have artists like Chance the Rapper who sort of did it all on his own. And so he goes out and sells four million records. That's all his money, right? It's all his. And he can then use that to build his own company. Uh, and it really makes artists more business-minded, I think. And if you can do that, you can make a long life for yourself. And, you know, 
to your question about the light at the end of the tunnel, I think my message here is that it's not about the light at the end, it's about the actual tunnel, right? It's about the journey that you're on. And uh, people would call me an aspiring artist. I'm like, I'm not an aspiring artist, I'm an artist, right? I got paid to perform tonight. Uh, you just saw me get off stage, I got paid. I'm an artist already, right? <laughs> um, and so it's about appreciating the journey, making what you can as you go along. And artists, have, it's, it's a tough industry to make money as an artist, but um, in any arts, right? Not just music, right? Visual arts, I mean, artists sort of struggle naturally. That's why programs like Backline are, are key, because um, it gives us a little bit of financial e equity or equality or whatever it is. But ultimately, it's about the journey, man. Yeah, um, did, did everybody hear a question? So here. Okay, so um, I was telling him um, there's um, the book The Alchemist, it speaks, there's a portion of it that tells you, you know, you decide your destiny and the world will push everything into your corner to make that, you know, s success happen. Um, and he said that he wants to promote, you know, the success of other people coming up. How does he promote them to keep in line that, you know, they've already decided that what they're going to be success successful with. The world has probably provided them the people that will help them, you know, further their, you know, you know career. How, do, how does he remind them to keep those people and not turn to the worldly ways or what looks better or what looks more successful? Damn, that's a really great question. So thanks for referencing The Alchemist. That's one of the books that sort of changed my life as well. Um, when I think about your question, I think about kids in school. And I think a little bit about the, the things that we place value on in our education system. And I have always sort of cringed when I hear people talk about STEM education. And I don't want y'all to be mad at me. Some of y'all are <laughs> engineers, I'm sure. But when I was in school, there, STEM wasn't really a thing, right? And I had the ability to sort of think about what I wanted to be and pursue that in education. And I wasn't told that if I didn't pursue a career in science or technology or engineering or math that I was less valuable. And I think that's the message we're giving kids today, right? We have, we have you know, we put STEAM in it now, but it's, uh, okay, just to make people like me happy, you put an A in there. <laughs> Because it, it's STEAM, it's basically everything now. Now it's just back to general education. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, getting back to a space where we, we value arts, right? We value careers that are creative. And I think, I think back to a teacher I had. So when I was in school, in high school, just like college, school was just kind of a place I went to rap, right? It wasn't like, I don't give a shit. I'm doing my homework just so I don't get kicked out. I come to school just enough to not have you call my mom and tell her I didn't come to school. Um, but I was just there to rap and I started to get in trouble for rapping so much. I would be in biology class, for instance, and the teacher thinks I'm taking notes. She comes over and I got like five songs written in the class. <laughs> and I got in trouble and I'm sitting in the principal's office and they're gonna call my mom and tell them that I'm not paying attention in school and then in walks our drama teacher, our school's drama teacher. And she's like, hey, she knew me from sort of rapping around school. She's like, hey, Josh, what are, you, what are you doing in here? And I tell her I'm in trouble. And she goes and tells the principal, don't worry, I'm going to take him with me. And so she took me with her, and she said, instead of writing raps in class, if you'll commit to just doing your work, staying focused, I'll give you my classroom during both lunch periods, and you and your friends can have rap battles in my classroom. So she encouraged me to... to pursue my passion, you know, you sort of have to keep it in the lines, right? She's like, just stay out of trouble, but pursue this as much as you want during the school day. And that was transformative for me and the 50 or 60 other kids that would come every lunch period and rap. Um, so I think we need, her name was Miss Hines. I think we need more people like Miss Hines to stand up and encourage kids to pursue their passions and uh, remind them that just, I suck at math, right? And just because I suck at math, doesn't mean I'm less intelligent or less special than the engineering kids, right? So I think just sort of recalibrating how we educate kids is how I would do that. So thank you. All right, one more. I'm gonna go with you. <laughs> thank you. 
Damn, thank you. Wow. Thanks, man. You know I'm a crier by now, so I already told you that. <laughs> thank you. Good dreams and or and bad dreams. Um, I think my answer to that would be sort of to reference back to the presentation, right? I think it's less about the dream and more about the motivation behind the dream, right? I think you know that sort of dead end wall that I hit because of that 2006 dream was because I sort of accepted the dream that I thought everyone else wanted for me, right? I'm like, okay, to be successful, I have to have these things. The dream was the same, but the reason behind it was a little bit different, right? And I think if it were me, right, I'm raising my kids to be free and to, to, to um, you know, pursue what, what that, that feeling in your stomach, that sort of, that thing that you wake up thinking about and go to sleep thinking about all day, I encourage them to pursue that um, and for the right reasons, because they really want to do it, because they believe in it, and because they feel like it's their purpose. So I think... Maybe not good dreams or bad dreams, but there's good motivation and bad, moti bad motivation, right? And I w in, in my estimation, the material things sort of, sort of cloud your judgment. And so, you know, I think just sort of real, true foundational motivation is important. Damn, that was a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Can we take one more? Yeah. Oh, all right, maybe two more. Yeah. <laughs> Did y'all hear that question? So you asked me, uh, I'll try to paraphrase because this, this is a good one, and I like your kicks, by the way. Um, <laughs> essentially, he asked me uh, whether or not my music and the sort of themes and narratives in my music are reflective of where I was or where I am at any sort of stage in this story, uh, and whether or not, as I reflect upon my lyrics, if it's uh, an appalling experience or if it's sort of a, what was the other word you used? Fascinating. Fascinating. Man, you know, m the music that I made pre-college, right? So I won my first freestyle battle at 13. Uh, I signed with Terminator X from Public Enemy as my manager at 14. Uh, released an album with my group The Third Day at 15. Worked with Ninth Wonder and Nicolay and all of these Grammy Award winning producers by the before I was 18. I love that music, right? That music was much more centered on that 1995 dream. The music after 2006, I can't even listen to now. I can't even stomach it because it was like steeped in all of this, the money, the cars, the fame, the, the womanizing, the misogyny, the, you know, the violence, the, like all of these themes that aren't really me. And I don't know that they ever were, but I felt like I had to be. Um, so it's the, the 1995 to 2006 stuff I really like. The 2006 to 2010 stuff I absolutely hate. It's, it's appalling. Um, my music is always about my life. So if you want to know me, if you want to you know, get to know me better than a 30-minute talk, just listen to my songs. I, I'm a completely an open book, right? And um, Yeah, go back. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, that's a part of who I am too, right? Those are things. And the, 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 the other important point is I was rapping about those things, and I was also doing those things, right? And so th that's a whole other TED Talk about how destructive um, sort of chasing money and fame can be. It really, I was destroying myself and, d and hurting a lot of other people at the same time. So, yeah, it is a bit appalling to listen to those, those themes. Thank you for that. All right, I saw the brother in the back, and we're going to have to go.
Mm. Yeah, I always tell people in order to chase a dream, you have to be a little bit uh, delusional. I think you need a delusional sense of self-worth, a delusional sense of uh, your own abilities. You have to believe, in spite of your actual limitations, that you have none, right? You have to be, dude, when Wendy Goldstein shook my hand and, and, and just sort of ruined my dreams at the moment, in order for me to pick myself up a couple weeks later and get back on that stage in Korea and not feel like a total fraud or a clown, I had to be delusional enough to believe that I belong there, right? And um, I think carrying that vision with just the right amount of sort of delusional self-belief or self-esteem uh, is the key. And that's, that's Puff, right? That's Diddy. I, I've, I've had a chance to meet Diddy, and um, he is just this ultimate, he believes in himself more than anybody I've ever met. <laughs> like... It's just crazy how much he believes in himself, but what he will also do is make you believe in yourself. So, short story, then I know we gotta go. So, the day I met Puff was that same day you saw me standing next to MC Light. It was my first BET Awards, and I was standing in line at the bathroom, and Puff is standing in line in front of me to go, Diddy is standing in line in front of me to go to the bathroom, because it's, it's like a green carpet at BET, and uh, I turned my head because uh, another guy that grew up in Durham that I know named Ryan Schaefer, was at the, he worked at BET at the time. He's like, yo, Gun, what's up, what you doing here? And we're talking, and he like points behind me. He's like, bro, that's Diddy behind you. So I turn around, and now I'm nervous. I don't want to speak to him. And he's like, yo, what's up, man? He was like, uh, what you doing here? And I was like, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, he's like, speak up. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm here. I'm a rapper. I just signed with MC Light. He was like, that's all you, that's your intro? He was like, you should start introducing yourself as what you want to be. He was like, he used to introduce himself when he was Andre Harrell's intern. He would say, I'm going to own this company one day. My name is Sean Combs. <laughs> right? And, you know, I'm like, okay. He was a little drunk, right? <laughs> but it, it stuck with me. And then he also, in a classic Diddy way, told me something that I always keep with me as well. He was like, you're going to get a lot of people that hate on you. He was like, when you show this picture to your folks at home, some people are going to hate on you and be jealous that you were here. He was like, I want you to remember throughout your career to lean into the love, meaning that there could be a room full of people, a thousand people, and they're booing you. He was like, find that person who's clapping for you, and that's your center of gravity, right? Lean into the love and away from the hate. So oftentimes when we pursue our dreams, we want to please the people who don't believe us. Like, you know, we say you know, in the hip-hop community, I can't wait to stun on my haters, right? I can't wait till I get this money, and I'm going to pull up on all the people that said I could never do it. But that shouldn't be your motivation. Remember your mom or your sister or whoever supports you and lean into that love. And I thank Drunk Diddy for that advice, man, because it was super, super helpful. <laughs> thank y'all so much, man. I really enjoyed it. Thank y'all. That was awesome.